right, well, it's good to be here again preaching in these uh, odd times. And uh, I'm going to try to sing a song today for the message. And that is, His Eyes on the Sparrow, and I Know He Watches Me. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is He. For His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free, for His eye is on the sparrow. And I know He watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, His tender word I hear. And resting on His goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though by the path He leadeth, but one step I may see, His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when song gives place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to Him. From care He sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. Sing it with me if you know it. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to Psalm 133. Psalm 133. It's been a real blessing for Calvary Baptist Church down the road here to join with you in these uh, parking lot uh, worship services. And uh, we appreciate New Life hosting it. And for all the folks from Calvary, uh, we will be back here again next week. I'm just uh, waiting on the governor to uh, go to phase two. I think that's a good caution. And we just, we've just really enjoyed just meeting together with the folks here from New Life each week. And almost hate to give it up. It's just been a real blessing for us. What we're going to look at today is a topic of Christian unity. And uh, as we think about what we've been able to do for the last uh, two months meeting here, I think God is pleased with it. And I think He looks down and He says, you know what? Christian brothers and sisters are able to worship together in the Lord. And this is a beautiful thing. We're able to serve together in the Lord. We're able to uh, come together and uh, whether it's Brother Don or Brother Caleb, you know, I don't worry about those two guys because I know if they preach it, it's going to be good, it's going to be sound, and it's going to be something that, that the people at Calvary, the people at New Life, myself, my family, are going to get some benefit from, from the Lord. And so Psalm 133 is one of the shorter psalms, and it says, A Song of Degrees of David. 
Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you today as we look into your word to speak to our hearts, to encourage us, Heavenly Father. Lord, it's so sweet in your sight, and it's so sweet when we as Christians can come together and worship you and pray to you and hear from your word. And we ask you just to speak to our hearts as we look at this passage today. Help us to see as things start getting back to normal that it's your will for us to be together with other believers and that it's a sweet and wonderful thing when we can come together in unity as your children. Help this preacher today, fill him with your spirit, give him the words we need for this hour. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It says here in verse number one, well before verse number one, it says a song of degrees of David. The one who wrote this was a guy named King David. And he knew what it was like to have a divided nation. King David, if you remember, was anointed by Samuel while King Saul was still king. And King Saul tried to kill David so that one of his sons, instead of David, could be on the throne instead. Well, we know that what God decrees, he does. And so, sure enough, Saul died. But one of... Uh, Saul's sons rose up and tried to take the kingdom. And so David and this, this boy, they had a civil war. But then finally, finally, uh, David's foes were defeated. And the nation of Israel came together around King David, God's anointed. Perhaps that's when David wrote this song. Some other people, you know, think that perhaps he wrote this psalm as he saw the people all over Israel coming to Jerusalem in order to worship the one true God, the God of the Bible, the one that David sang about and wrote about. And as he saw the many different tribes coming together, David wrote this psalm saying, Wow, this is wonderful. This is a taste of heaven on earth. Whatever the case, we believe that David wrote this psalm. And he says, Behold. Now when you see the word behold, you think about the idea of this is something unusual that you need to check out. You know, look at this. Remember John the Baptist when he saw Jesus said what? Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is something unusual. This is something you don't see every day. He says, Behold, how good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Good. This is something that's agreeable with God's will, and therefore it's something that's the right thing for us to do. Pleasant. This is something that God delights in, being the God of peace, and something that's enjoyable for us, and it's something that also attracts the world to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we think about God being a father, and uh, many of you out there are parents, and some of you uh, have more than one child, and sometimes those children don't get along. <laughs> and when those children don't get along, it's a very unpleasant thing for the parents. Parents love it. You know, when, when you're, you're united as a family, and when you're, you're getting along, and everything is just, uh, you're encouraging one another instead of fighting with each other. And that's how God feels about His church. And that is, here are my children, those who are saved through the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are joint heirs with Christ. And here we are, dwelling together in unity. God is our Father, and we see the, the same book, the Word of God, is our rule book. We see that we are part of the family of God. The word pleasant in the Hebrew 
is sometimes used for harmony in music. You know, when you think about a, a concert getting started, and you hear all the instruments tuning up, you hear all these different, different instruments out there, and they're all just in different tunes and making different sounds. That's discord. That's ugly. It's kind of like uh, someone taking their fingernails and going down the chalkboard. But then all of a sudden, the conductor gets up there, and he starts waving his little wand, and all the instruments come together to make a beautiful song. Well, that's the word here for pleasant. It's kind of like a quartet. Many of you probably like quartet singing, and you have one singing the, 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 the lead, and one singing the tenor, one singing the bass. Maybe you'll throw an alto in there somewhere. All coming together. But yet, when you have a, a trio or a quartet, and one of them's out of sync or out of tune, <laughs> what is it? It sounds awful, and you notice it. Pleasant. 2 Corinthians 3.11 says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Live in peace. And the God of peace shall be with you. Matthew 18, verse 19 says, If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them, of my Father, which is in heaven. Two, agree concerning God's will on this earth. Ask the Father, in my name, Jesus says, it shall be done for you. Look at Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. I was talking with Brother Caleb before the service. And he was talking about how uh, in people trying to have the right to meet together as a, as a church, that uh, we ought to emphasize the right to peaceably assemble. He said a lot of people would say, well, you can worship in your home. You know, you can uh, hear preaching in your home, and that's acceptable. But you know what? There's, there's a power there when Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, come together in one place to worship, to fellowship, to hold each other accountable, to hear the preaching and teaching of God's Word, the assembling together. And that's what David is saying here. And like I said, whether it was when the kingdom was united, and he was talking about his literal brothers and sisters of Israel, or whether it was when they would come up for worship there in Jerusalem at the tabernacle. This is what he was talking about here. Romans chapter 14, beginning of verse 16. And if you know your Bible, this is talking about some disputes that came up in the early church. Some people said, well, you know, there's a certain diet uh, based upon the Old Testament law that you need to follow in order to be right with God. Some people said, well, there are certain holy days that you need to celebrate, like the Passover and things like that if you want to be right with God. And this was causing real divisions in the church because, say, the Jewish people were saying that in the church. The Gentile people were saying, well, we're free of that. We're free in Christ. Christ has fulfilled that part of the ceremonial law. How do you deal with differences in the church? You know, there's a... It's very easy. Very easy. If you just don't have any relationships in your life very easy but it's very lonely as well and I'm afraid there was a, a survey put out by Barna and said that during this time of the coronavirus 48 percent of people who go to churches have had no contact with their church through online or drive-in services or anything like that 20 percent have uh, sought out spirituality from other sources and there are a lot of different sources out there but 40% is all that's stayed connected with our local church during this time. Well, you know, it's a lot easier. You know, someone uh, was joking and said that uh, they're going to miss not having on their pajamas while they go to church. <laughs> someone else said, well, I'll miss not having the mute button <laughs> when I go to church. But it's a lot easier. People are difficult. 
There was a, a preacher who said the ministry would be great if it wasn't for the people, but the people is ministry. Without people, there's no ministry. So how do we get along? Well, in Romans chapter 14, this is what Paul was dealing with here. Beginning in verse 16. It says, Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify one another. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. What is Paul saying here to the church at Rome? What is he saying to us today? What he's saying is this. As we come back together as churches, as we meet as churches, there needs to be a desire on our part not to needlessly offend brothers and sisters in Christ. And this desire not to needlessly offend over issues that are not clearly spelled out in the Bible is acceptable to God and approved of men. So we go back to our text and it says here, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity brethren. This is the, the family. Like I said, it could be the physical family of Israel that David is referring to, or most likely I believe it's the spiritual family, and that is those who are the children of God. It says here to dwell. The word dwell means a permanent residency. It's not just abide, but it's to dwell. And so when we think about our church family, we are going to be living together if we're saved, not only in this life, but also through all of eternity. Think about that. Eternal life begins the moment you receive Christ as your Savior. And for those who are born again, this world is not it. And it's wonderful to have fellow pilgrims and strangers in this world going to a country above that we can draw strength from and encourage one another. But it says, it is good and it is pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity, to live and worship God together. So it is good and pleasant when God's people are united by love, love for God and love for each other, united by the truth, which is found in the Word of God, the Bible, and unified in mission, which is carrying out the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus prays for this unity. We look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Beginning in verse number 14. This is Jesus' prayer for his church, for those that he leaves behind. And he says to them, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Now let's stop here, because a lot of people like to use John chapter 17 and say, hey, you know, let's just get together with all kinds of people who call themselves Christian. But we see here that the basis of biblical unity is the sanctifying truth of the word of God. Sanctify means set them apart. We're in this world, the kingdom of this world, and yet we're not fully citizens of this world. We're citizens of God's kingdom. And so he's saying, separate my people, Jesus is saying, from this world based upon the truth of the word of God. It says in verse number 18, 
As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. The word sanctified means set apart. He set apart himself for a particular mission, that we might be set apart for a particular mission as well. Neither pray I for these alone, his apostles who were there with him, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's all of us. Those of us who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ through the testimony of the word of God. Jesus praying for us. It says that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus prays for his church that it would be united by the word of God for the purpose of seeing lost souls saved and for the purpose of loving God and seeing and enjoying his glory for all of eternity. John chapter 13 verse 35 is a truth that we need to remember. Jesus says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So we see here David, under inspiration of God's Spirit, saying that we, when we come together as one in unity around the Word of God, it is good because it's acceptable in God's sight, and it is pleasant. It is something that is desirous of both God and something that we should desire as well. And so David ends his psalm by giving two illustrations of this. Verse number two, we see that the unity of the church, of believers, is like precious ointment. Verse two begins, It is like the unity and the love of God's people is like the precious ointment upon the head. Now, what in the world is this talking about, this precious ointment upon the head? Well, if you go back to your Old Testament, the book of Exodus, chapter 30, we see this ointment, chapter 30, verses 23 through 31. It says here, Take thou also unto thee principal spices, of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil and hen, and thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary, it shall be a holy anointing oil. Now maybe, uh, someone would want to do this as a, as a project. You'd try to take all these ingredients and, and make an oil. And maybe you can uh, anoint Brother Don or myself or, or Brother Caleb or something. Of course, the Bible says that in the New Testament, we are all priests before God. So maybe you'd want to anoint yourself with this oil and see what it, what it smelled like. But what did they do with this holy oil? It says here, And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table and all his vessels, and the candlestick and his vessels, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels, and the laver and his foot, and thou shalt sanctify them, that they may be most holy. Whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them, 
that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be an holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. So what is this saying here? This oil that they would put together would be uh, poured all around the tabernacle and it would be poured on Aaron or whoever his son was who was the high priest. And so what that meant is when God's people came to the tabernacle to worship, there was a certain odor, a beautiful odor that they smelled when they went. Now think about this time. You know, you, you didn't have things like deodorant back then, and you didn't have all the expensive perfumes and things like that as readily available. And so this was a special time when you would come to the tabernacle, you would smell this particular odor. And they were very generous with this ointment, this perfume. Because it says here in our text, in Psalm 133, that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. This ointment, this perfume, was applied liberally. It was put on the high priest's head, and it ran down through his beard, and even got on the collar of his priestly clothing. Now what is the application of this? Well, I think the application for the New Testament is this. Christian love flows from God to us, and then its sweetness is smelt by the entire world. You know, I think about my childhood, and there was a man, he's probably passed on now, he was older when I was a child, and his name was Cecil Swartz. And he was a Sunday school superintendent in the church I grew up in. And he would come up behind us, we'd sit in the same pew every week, and you could smell him coming. <laughs> you know, those older men back then, they'd put on that cologne, and you, you, you remember, some of you who remember those days, now people are allergic to it, and they don't do that as much. And he'd come and he'd shake my hand every Sunday. And when I smelt that cologne, I knew that Cecil Swartz was on his way to greet me and shake our hand in Sunday school. But you know what? As people come to our churches, they ought to be able to smell the odor of the love of Christ in our lives and then the love that we have for our brothers and sisters in Christ that pours over in a love for this lost and dying world. You know, our church hooked up to the sewer when it came up through George's Fork. And it was all right during the winter. But when it started getting a little warmer, the church started smelling. And uh, we had some hot days, and we had a funeral last fall, and it was coming into church. And finally, they did do a smoke test and found that we needed to secure a, a pipe on top of the church. And we did, and we haven't had those problems since then. But uh, it was a lot more sewer gas coming through than when, uh, when we just had the septic tank. But the point of this is, what do people smell when they come in your church? <laughs> do they smell the ointment of the love of God flowing in and through you and the ointment of the Holy Spirit filling you and controlling you and leading and guiding the church? Or do they smell the, the sewer gas of sin and corruption and division and hatred in the church? May God's love fill us so that people, even in this world, can sense that when they come into our church, they're in the presence of a loving God and his people. Just like when the people would go to the tabernacle, they could smell this beautiful ointment all over the high priest. But we see another illustration in verse number 3. This, this, this love, this unity, this one spirit is compared to precious ointment, but it's also compared to dew from heaven. It says, as the dew of Hermon and as the dew 
that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Now Hermon was a tall mountain. Some say it was a mountain range that was north of Israel. And from Hermon flowed the Jordan River. And this uh, land of uh, the mountain of Hermon, there was somebody who wrote that uh, he stayed there overnight and the dew was so thick that you could feel it in the morning all over you. The dew from heaven. You know, dew is a very important thing, especially in a dry land, a dry desert land. I was able to go to my mom's and be with her as she had uh, her wrist operated on. And uh, little Jenny and I were watching a, uh, a TV show on public television about this explorer. I'd never seen this show before. And uh, the week before, Trey and I had watched it on a, a guy going into the jungles of South America. This time he was going to a mountain in Oman over in the Arabian Peninsula. And one of the scenes in this documentary or whatever it is was him waking up and looking at a plant. And he noticed on that plant the dew hanging off the leaves of that plant. And he said this. He said, this dew is what gives life to the plants and to all the life here in this mountain in Oman. And this dew is what? It is the unity, the love, and the peace of Christian believers around the Word of God and around the the person of God and around the mission of God to reach the lost and disciple the saved. It says, And as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded his blessing, even life forevermore. Now as this uh, part of the passage, as the, the dew of Hermon was speaking of a physical, literal dew, that brought a physical, literal life. I think that this part is talking about the spiritual dew from heaven that rested upon the tabernacle there in Jerusalem and later the temple where the true God was being worshipped and taught. And so as the dew on Mount Hermon brought forth physical life, so the unity of God's people gathered to worship Him in Jerusalem brought blessings upon them as well. Strength and love that would remain with them throughout all of eternity. You know, it's sad. And I'd say everyone in here has either experienced 